So uh, we welcome you all to our forum, our dear forum, uh, Himalayan Institute of Cultural and Heritage Studies. And I am so, so happy that today we have Dr. Parth Johan, who is such an integral part uh, of uh, the Institute as well. We do our projects together, but today it is all about him and his work. So for those of you who, do, who are not aware of uh, uh, Parth's um, academic, uh, uh, you know, uh, journey. So I'll shed a little uh, light on that. Uh, Parth uh, uh, researches on the geoarchaeology of Sonian sites in the Shivalik Hills near Chandigarh. Now, those of you who are not aware of uh, Sonian, it's, it comes from the uh, Soan Valley and uh, basically talks about uh, the occupation of the Homo erectus, the possible occupation of Homo erectus in the Shivaliks. So that's very, very important. And those of you who are not archaeologists and who are joining us today, they will get to hear about the technology, context, landscape distribution patterns in the Himalayas. So that's really, really fascinating. Uh, his current projects include a uh, Narmada Basin Paleoanthropology project, which is uh, in Madhya Pradesh, uh, to look at the prehistoric record of human occupation, which includes stone technologies, vertebrate fossils, and rock art. He also works in the modern human environmental adaptations in the Tapi Basin in Maharashtra, and he's collaborating with the Maharashtra State Department at a cave site in the Konkan, as well as with American colleagues in the Sudan, to look at signatures of dispersals within and out of Eastern Africa. Well, and that's not all, because Parth and I work together on historical archaeology in the Kulu Valley in the Western Himalayas, and we are sure to uh, increase and expand what he specializes in, in uh, the valley and uh, 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 in the Western Himalayas as a whole. Uh, for those of you who want to know about how we got to know each other. It was almost 22 years ago that Parth and I met in, um, um, in a conference in Kerala. Am I correct, right? Yes. Uh, at that point in time, uh, he was a budding archaeologist. I was a wannabe archaeologist. I, I, I was a lawyer at that point in time and our friendship continued from there. And I'm so, so happy that he's such an important uh, part of, uh, of, of course, my life and what we do together uh, in work. We, uh, we really stand for academic, um, um, uh, you know, knowledge and non-academic knowledge and uh, dispersing it to everyone. And uh, we hope to do a lot in the future as well. And on that note, Parth, today he will be talking about prehistoric occupations uh, human colonization of the Himalaya and the Shivalik regions. So Parth, over to you and the platform is yours. And at this point, I would like uh, everyone to please uh, mute their mics and uh, also um, um, uh, stop their videos, including me. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll share my file now. So um, before I get to my topic, uh, I'll be covering a general background of uh, human evolutionary milestones and then getting into the relevance of the Indian uh, region for prehistory. And then finally, just giving a rough uh, sketch of current status of uh, our knowledge of the Himalayas and uh, the Shivalik region. So just for people who are not familiar with this uh, time period, I'll just give you a little background. Uh, prehistory basically defines a time of human existence before the invention of writing. But language existed, uh, whether it was uh, complex or simple, and communication existed as well. And I'll tell you the, the actual time brackets as well. And then protohistory is an intermediate phase between prehistory and history. And basically, it's characterized by the beginning of domestication uh, of plants and animals and widespread agriculture and settlement uh, of uh, villages. And then we have historical period, which is basically since the use of extensive writing. So writing does start in proto-history, but it's more extensive and established in the historical phase. Now, if you look at the time brackets, uh, we have Stone Age, 
which starts at roughly 3.3 million years ago. And this is based on current evidence, all this known stone tools. But we also have to respect that it includes other materials. The reason it's called the Stone Age is because it's dominated by stone tools. But they're also probably using wood, antler, bone, um, ivory, all other perishable materials. But because it's not survived uh, and it's dominated by stone tools, it's called the Stone Age. And stone tools, in fact, continue uh, up to modern day times. And then we have the Bronze Age, which is about 5,000 years ago onwards. And it's the beginning of the use of tin and copper, zinc, and then bronze. And then the Iron Age roughly starts around 1500 BC. So again, I would like to highlight that stone tool use continues and bronze also continues. So older technologies continue uh, into younger time periods, younger cultural phases. Now, where do we get our information from? As paleoanthropologists or scientists who study human evolution from a multidisciplinary perspective, uh, we have context from archeological sites, geological sites, and fossil sites where we get our specimens or sediments, and that can include stone tools, human fossils, animal fossils, sediments, uh, organic material, inorganic material. And then we also use all this information to get additional uh, data. For example, these days we have access to uh, DNA, uh, modern DNA and ancient DNA. And then we also carry out environmental reconstructions using different scientific techniques to situate the archeological evidence in a environmental framework. How are these different species adapting to their environments? Uh, what was happening during climate change? And so on and so forth. And then we use modern analogs to interpret past uh, landscapes and past environmental context as well. So just a general information of what we uh, look for and what we study. So just to give you a very broad background before I get to the Indian evidence in the, in the Himalayan zone, um, we have Human evolution starting in Africa, as most of you know, the oldest bipedal hominin species go back about 7 million years. Um, and there's at least 30 species reported and growing, and also uh, six genera at least. So with more and more uh, specimens being found every year, uh, our hypotheses and our family tree keeps changing. But at the moment, most of our evidence comes from various uh, locations uh, across the old world. Um, and then we have new and new uh, species being found uh, and trying to accommodate those, whether they were in our lineage or not. Uh, and of course, stone tool technologies are being found along with these. So just a general uh, scheme here, showing you connections between different species. And there's no consensus on this. There's a lot of disagreement about which species belong where and which are related to uh, the human lineage. Now, just to quickly cover evolutionary milestones, so you get an idea of the time scale we're looking at. When did certain things happen? Whether it was biological evolution, behavioral evolution, or technological uh, evolution. The earliest hominins appear roughly 7 million years ago, so is bipedalism, and that's when we separate from the chimpanzees. Then 3.3 million years ago, the oldest stone tools appear, which is called Lamequian. 2.6 million years ago, the older one technology appears, and that shows the earliest evidence for butchery or meat eating. That doesn't necessarily mean hunting, but it shows evidence of meat eating. So they could have gotten the meat from scavenging as well. One million years ago, our genus appears. We seem to leave Africa roughly around 2.2 million years ago, based on current evidence. 1.7 million, uh, the Acheulean is invented, or at least it appears based on current evidence. It could be a little older. And then the oldest evidence of fire at the moment is 1.5 million from South Africa. In the middle, Paleolithic emerges between half a million and 400,000 years ago. And then many of you are familiar with Neanderthals. They evolve or appear in Europe independently 
around 400, 350,000 years ago. Uh, having the oldest uh, burials, about 100,000 years, 130. And this species is the first one to have this uh, behavior uh, before uh, Homo sapiens for now. Uh, and this is also the beginning of the earliest symbolic behavior. And then our species appears roughly at the same time in Africa. And then uh, our species reaches Europe 200,000 years ago, which is Levant after that. And then China, based all on fossil evidence, by 100,000 years ago. Small artifacts called microliths. Small artifacts called microliths appear at 65,000 years ago. Then Homo sapiens arrives again, second dispersal, and replaces the Nearly. And then 50,000 years to 25,000 years ago, Homo floresiensis and the Neanderthals become extinct. So there are various factors why they become extinct, and there's a lot of debates whether Homo sapiens was responsible or not. And then we have the oldest microliths in Eurasia which are actually in uh, Sri Lanka and India at the moment. And the Mesolithic Neolithic transition occurs 10,000 years ago. So the beginning of domestication, pastoralism, agriculture starts, the Neolithic phase. Just a very broad overview. Um, the earliest evidence of ornamentation at the moment is about 120,000 years old in the Levant and Africa. So they're making shell beads and this is assumed to uh, belong to uh, Homo sapiens. And then possibly the oldest known paintings made by Neanderthals, in fact, uh, at least 65,000 years old. This is a little controversial, but it's reported, so we have to uh, follow it. Then we have other forms of uh, symbolic behavior. Engravings, for example, on ochre 77,000 years ago in South Africa on these ostrich eggshell fragments uh, in various locations across the world, including India. This is uh, top left is a specimen from Patna, and that's 25,000 years old. The ones on the, on the bottom are 60,000 years old. So these are all different uh, evidences of symbolic behavior. And then when Homo sapien reaches Europe for the second time, around 45 to 50,000 years ago, gradually there's another symbolic uh, behavior explosion uh, in terms of figurines, paintings, engravings, uh, various other behaviors, use of ochre. And then between 20,000 and 18,000, we have the oldest pottery in uh, Eastern uh, Asia. Very, very simple handmade pottery. And then also pestle and mortars appear. So this basically shows the beginning of food processing and food storage. Because the population is increasing, they're harvesting more and more food, and long-term storage is there. And then finally, uh, humans get to the North American zone and then South American zone, uh, possibly around 20,000 years ago. The most common route is from west to east through Siberia, but there's also been hypotheses offered from east to west, from uh, Europe to eastern coast of the U.S. Uh, there is one site that is supposedly, supposedly uh, 130,000 years old in California, but again, it's controversial. And then after that, we have many, many dispersals. So basically, in sum, we have multiple dispersals of different species going in different directions from Africa and, and taking with them different technologies and, of course, uh, adapted to different, different environments. Uh, so some species die out, some species continue. But ultimately, uh, Homo sapiens is the one that becomes dominant and replaces all other species at a global level. So these are different technologies that appear, stone tools basically. And on the left, we have the timings of invention. And on the right, we have timings of dispersal from Africa. And if you notice, um, Lomequian is there at 3.3 million. And there's nothing between 3.3 and 2.6 at the moment. No archaeology is known. But from 2.6 million onwards, it's a continuous record everywhere, more or less. And there's multiple dispersals sometimes of the same technology, like Acheulean, uh, you notice, out of Africa 2A, 2B. 
Um, and then Homo sapiens disperses multiple times with different technologies. And once these technologies become established in Europe, in India, in China, then they follow their own trajectories. So the younger technologies have multiple origins, while the older technologies seem to have possibly single origins uh, within Africa. Now, why is the India subcontinent uh, or India important for global understanding global human evolution? One thing is that it's in the center of the old world. It links the records of Africa, Europe, and Eastern Asia. But whether it was used as a corridor uh, from west to east and east to west, is a different issue. But at the, at the moment, biogeographically, is in the center of the old world. Then stone tools were discovered here roughly at the same time as in Europe, 1800s, very early historically. There's continuous human occupation since 1.5 million, maybe even earlier, and preserves technologies from all prehistoric phases. There's no missing uh, cultural uh, uh, phases. Various animal species existed, and some of them are very distinct or uh, indigenous uh, to this region. But human evolution has not been uh, studied that much compared to other zones. Uh, it's a historical reason, and there's various other limitations like lack of funding uh, and popular interest in younger time periods. There's many, many factors for this, many explanations. Uh, and there's also a lack of adequate human fossils compared to Africa, China, Europe, and also absolute ages for sites. We have thousands of sites, but we don't know how old they are. And if you don't know how old they are, we cannot talk about relationships with other regions and dispersal events and timings of arrival, timings of innovations. And this is the only known non-homo or pre-homo sapien uh, fossil from Narmada Valley. Uh, it's probably erectus, even though it's not clear exactly because of the uh, fragmentary nature of it. But and the age is also not clear, but this is the only uh, well-known cranium we have. So looking at the first dispersal, hominins get to Eastern Asia or Eastern China by 2.1 million. They get to uh, the European zone, Damanisi, 1.8 million. In Southeast Asia, about 1.5 million. So you can see uh, they get all, to all these regions very early, soon after they appear in Africa. And then the next technology, which is Acheulean, and many of you are familiar, they're very distinct artifacts, uh, hand axes and cleavers, are actually reaching India by 1.5 million. So they get invented at 1.7 million, and 200,000 years later, they've already reached South India, uh, the site of Atirambakkam. So this gray zone that you see on the map is showing the distribution of Acheulean technology. Uh, and now, in the last few years, they have started to find similar technologies in China and Korea. So now the question is, are these technologies with the red dots representing Acheulean dispersals, or do they represent independent innovations uh, separate from the Acheulean? And what is missing at the moment is intermediate evidence in this geographic zone, Central Asia. So we don't have any uh, clear evidence of dispersals from west to east, but there's also a lack of research. Not many surveys have been done in Central Asia. So it's possible that in the future, you might find sites uh, leading to East Asia, like a corridor. But we also have to keep in mind that there could have been independent innovations. And a third possibility is that they could have been both, a mixture of incoming dispersals from the west and uh, independent innovations because older one technology had already established itself in Eastern Asia and other places. Um, and also we don't know whether they went through India or only Central Asia or both routes were taken. We don't know this for sure. But one thing is clear that Acheulean is very, very marginal at the moment uh, outside this gray zone. Then we come to India and if you look at this map, why does Acheulean technology end in India or appear to end in India is because of various biogeographic features. Here we have a map of the subcontinent. The red line is the boundary for Acheulean hand axes and cleavers, uh, the Mauvais line as, as it's been called. And on the bottom, we have these green zones, uh, Kerala, Southern Tamil Nadu, 
in Sri Lanka. These are also places where no Ashwagandha is known. Now, if you look at it uh, ecologically, topographically, and uh, geographically, we have the Tibetan Plateau, very high elevation zone. Uh, the oldest prehistoric evidence there is about uh, now uh, uh, 130,000 years old. And following that, it's about 45,000 years old. But Ashulian is much older. So maybe it's possible Ashulian did not get there or adapt to higher high elevation environments. In the, the Himalaya, as a topographic barrier, the Ganga Plains, and this is considered a barrier in a way uh, because it, it lacks suitable raw material. It lacks rocks for making uh, stone tools. But it's possible that many of the sites are actually buried underneath the uh, Ganga alluvium and sites were uh, present. And then we have the Northeast zone, which is actually different from rest of uh, central and peninsular India. It's hilly, it's thick, has thick vegetation, is tropical environment, and uh, it is very humid. So Acheulean sites are not found in these kind of environments in other parts of the world and India. So just like South India and Sri Lanka, Northeast India uh, might have been avoided by Acheulean hominins uh, or by Paleolithic populations in general. Uh, and they were probably dispersed to East Asia via Central Asia. Maybe whatever populations came into India just ended up staying uh, or even migrating back out uh, westwards, but not going eastwards. This is just a hypothesis based on current evidence. So in terms of modern humans, when did they first arrive? And what technology did they bring with them? The fossil evidence suggests 38,000 based on uh, fossils in Sri Lanka. And then Michaelitz, which is also associated with Homo sapiens, says 48,000. And genetic evidence of modern hunter-gatherers or modern travel groups suggests an arrival of about 60 to 65,000. And some researchers are saying that middle periodic uh, assemblages at some sites, uh, 77,000 and onwards up to about 120,000, uh, the middle periodic might have been brought in by Homo sapiens. But now this has been challenged in a way by a new discovery recently of an older middle periodic going back to 35,000. And this is contemporary now uh, with evidence in Africa, evidence in Europe, and Levant. So the transition from lower Paleolithic to middle Paleolithic is kind of happening uh, at the same time all across the old world. And this is again coming from uh, the side of Atirampakkam. It has the oldest Acheulean outside of Africa, and it seems to have one of the earliest uh, middle Paleolithic assemblages outside of Africa at the moment. So that kind of uh, questions things. It's possible that the earlier middle Paleolithic was made by uh, something uh, older than Homo sapiens, and the younger middle Paleolithic could have been made by Homo sapiens, or all of it could have been made by archaics, and then Michaeliths were the first one, the first technology brought in by uh, Homo sapiens. So we don't know until we find more fossils, until we get more dates, until we excavate more sites. And between this time period, there's a lot of fluctuations in technology. Some sites have bifaces, like hand axes and cleavers. Some sites don't have them. Some sites have only small ones. Some sites have large ones. Uh, some sites have a mixture of assemblages. And a major question, a debate going on, is what was the impact of the Toba super eruption? Now, we have this uh, volcanic eruption 74,000 years ago, and the volcano is in Sumatra. And all the ash, because of wind direction and the size of the volcanic eruption, got deposited in the intermediate uh, in the seas, as well as uh, across India. So there's been a debate about how much it affected ecology, and how did it affect human populations, and did it affect technological change or not? There's two sides, uh, minimal versus uh, more uh, impact. And the ash actually has been found all the way in South Africa and East Africa as well. Hippos and ostriches also become extinct 10,000 years ago. They were present across India. Um, and the causes of extinction are not clear. It could be a combination of climate change as well as human interference. As I said, that uh, humans were exploiting the eggshells for food, for engravings, for water containers, 
uh, for making beads. So that could have impacted uh, ostrich populations over time and they became extinct. And we also have very few fossils, uh, very few human fossils compared to other regions. We just have this Narmada cranium, which you see on the bottom, and everything younger than 38,000 belongs to Homo sapiens. It's found in India and Sri Lanka. The main reason for this is lack of uh, systematic surveys looking for human fossils, lack of experts in human fossils or human bones, and also the lack of right context for finding preservations of uh, human remains. Uh, you have animal remains, but you finding human remains is a different issue in terms of context and strategy. And as I said, a lot of technologies from 100,000 years onwards are very diverse. There's an overlap between different technologies. Lower Paleolithic, Middle Paleolithic overlaps, then Middle and Upper overlaps, and then the Upper and Microlithic overlaps. So there's a lot of uh, mixture and overlap and some technologies are missing in some regions of India. So we have technologies with bifaces, without bifaces, some are blade dominated, some are microlithic and blade dominated, some are exclusively microlithic. Uh, and 45,000 years ago, we have multiple sites uh, dated. Uh, for example, uh, site 55 is upper paleolithic, Kalpi in Ganga Valley is middle paleolithic, and then microlithic site of Metakeri is also same age. So we have different technologies at this time. So it's not easy to assign hom uh, uh, associate hominin species to the various technologies because they're, they're too diverse. And it's not clear if Homo sapiens was responsible for many of them. So there were multiple dispersals of Homo sapiens with different technologies over time, going in different directions out of Africa and using different routes. So we don't know when they reach uh, India. And when they left Africa, they encounter other species, which were there earlier from the earlier dispersals. So when they, when they, inter, when they reach uh, Levant, they interbreed with Neanderthals. When they reach Central Asia, they might have interbred with Denisovans. So we have this evidence from uh, fossils. We have this evidence from genetics of modern populations genetics from fossils. So there's a lot of different now growing evidence of this interbreeding. And the interbreeding probably happened in Africa also, all over the world. And now we come to the Himalaya. I wanted to give this broad overview so you can understand the Himalayan uh, evidence better and understand, appreciate, uh, and interpret the Shivalik evidence better. So the Shivalik zone, as you can see in the gray area, is parallel with the Himalaya. And there's a geological and geographic reason for that. Now, before I get to the actual formation of Shivalik Hills, uh, I would just like to highlight that the reason Shivalik Hills are famous is because of these fossils of Shivapithecus. They were found since 1800s, and then they started being found in Pakistan, uh, India, and Nepal, in the Shivaliks. And in the beginning, it was thought that this is a possible human ancestor. So there was a lot of attention on the Shivaliks. And Shivaliks are also famous for um, yielding many, many uh, animal fossils, just like Narmada Valley. So it's not clear exactly uh, until 1960s that this uh, species, Shivapithecus, was actually ancestral to orangutans, not uh, the human lineage. And well, what is important is um, as they started finding more and more sites, they found out that it's a different uh, it's an ape, basically, not a hominin. And it's not only found in Shivalik, because a recent discovery in Gujarat extended, extended its home range. So it's probably existing all over the subcontinent. But until now, we didn't know that for sure, until they found the specimen in Gujarat. So the Shivalik are famous uh, and well studied because of Shivapithecus. This is the general landscape of the Himalayas. Some areas are very, very uh, uh, highly vegetated. Some areas are very high relief. Some are low relief. Especially if you go from west to east, they become more thicker with vegetation. They become more and more higher and more rugged. Uh, towards the Pakistan side, the Shivalik hills are flat. But as you go eastwards, they become more high relief. And on the bottom, you see a photograph of the site of Masol showing a uh, badlands environment. 
So pockets of less vegetation, which yield uh, artifacts and fossils. And on the right, you have this sequence of different formation names. And the Shivalik uh, sequence goes back 18 million years. And what is interesting about this is that the Shivalik hills were not always hills. The Shivalik zone actually became hilly only about 1 million or 2 million years back. And this is how it happened. We have this Indian plate colliding with the Asian plate, and then gradually the greater Himalaya come up, followed by the lesser Himalaya, and then followed by the Shivaliks. So in the future, the Ganga plains directly south of the Shivaliks might also get uplifted a little bit. And all of them are uh, in sequence chronologically. So this shows how the Indian plate went under the Asian plate and uh, things got uplifted and erosion led to uh, uh, all, this, all these fossils and uh, artifacts uh, to be discovered. And here again, geographically, the gray area on the, on the bottom, the Shivalik zone or sub-Himalayan zone, all the sediments came from the Himalaya. At one time, it was a huge basin. And then the uh, sediments came from the Himalaya and then there was upliftment and then the sediment intake stopped. So today we don't have continuous buildup of sediment because of the upliftment. So when it was uplifted, it affected animal life, which probably migrated, and the hominins were probably affected as well in some ways. So the Shivalik zone is basically dominated by two types of technologies, Acheulean and Soanian. Acheulean is uh, comprised of these pointed hand axes and cleavers. And the Soanian is dominated by these chopper tools and flake tools. You can see a huge difference in morphology, in technology, in size. And the Soanian was originally uh, named in 1930s by Deterrent and Patterson when they worked in the Soan Valley of Pakistan. So based on this terror sequence of the Soan River, they thought that they could identify change in technology over time. But later work, in the 1980s by the British Archaeological Mission to Pakistan showed that these terraces were not reliable uh, for that sequence. They were more erosional terraces, not river terraces. So now the progression in Soinian is not accepted. But the Soinian is still recognized as a separate entity. Uh, it's a mysterious entity because there are no dates, there are no excavation, excavated sites. But now we're getting to uh, uh, know that there's a very interesting picture uh, in where these sites are found on the landscape. But this is when the historically is established as an independent uh, entity. These are some examples of Soanian tools. And the main characteristic is it's made on rounded rocks, pebbles, cobbles, boulders. Uh, it mostly comprises choppers, scrapers, uh, cores, core fragments. Uh, very simple technology. It looks, in fact, very primitive at first glance. But it also includes assemblages with advanced types, like Middle Paleolithic uh, Levalwa types. Um, so some assemblages look, look very simple, some assemblages look very advanced. So it's not clear exactly uh, the time frame. Here is the, one of the sources of raw material, how ancient hominins might have actually collected uh, rounded rocks to make these artifacts. This is in a river uh, along the hills. And this is where how, how sites are situated, the Acheulean sites and the Soanian sites. So most, most Paleolithic sites are situated in the Shivaliks and mostly in the frontal zone, where the Shivaliks meet uh, the Indo-Gangetic plains. Uh, just now we're starting to get idea of uh, some of these technologies penetrating deeper into the Himalaya. But most sites are in the frontal zone. So here is a distribution map of Acheulean sites and Soanian sites. And as you can see, the Soanian sites are more abundant, mostly because of the nature of raw material. The cobbles and pebbles are more abundant. And the Acheulean sites are less abundant because the cobbles and pebbles were too small to make large hand axes and cleavers. And of course, not enough surveys have been done to clearly uh, know the actual distribution pattern. 
Here are some examples of Ashwin artifacts. Uh, and this is coming from the site of Adbarapur near Hoshapur. Again, a shivalic frontal site. And this has typical uh, Ashwin hand axes and cleavers. So probably made by Homo erectus, but we can't say for sure until we find fossils. And then we also have Acheulean coming from Nepal Shivaliks. And this work was done by Corvinus in the 1980s and 90s. And it put Nepal on the map of prehistory. Um, uh, she found hand axes on tilted Shivalik sediments, suggesting that occupation took place before the tectonic activity. So before the upliftment and tilting of the Shivaliks. And she found some other assemblages, younger Acheulean, in the Dune Valleys of Nepal. So very complex history of uh, prehistoric occupation of the Shivalik zone in the Dune Valleys. The Dune Valleys in India have not yielded uh, Acheulean, but the Nepal Dune Valleys have yielded Acheulean. So what we're trying to understand is, uh, in the absence of absolute dates, how can we look at the landscape to compare Acheulean and Soinian sites? Where do they occur in the landscape? In the frontal zone, interior zone, on the slopes, on the terraces. So depending on location of these sites and depending on the artifact densities, the tool types present, the type of raw material associated, we're trying to get a picture of the relationship between them. Is one younger than the other? Or are some of them uh, contemporary? If they're contemporary, do they represent two different uh, cultural groups? or do they represent two different species making them? What's going on exactly? How old is a Soinian? When did this start? How old is Acheulean? When does it start? When do these technologies end in time? Uh, how are they dispersing on the landscape? So there's many, many things we don't know actually. And we also try to understand land use patterns, whether they're going from the plains to the dune valleys, where they're going from the dune valleys into the higher Himalaya, uh, at a seasonal level. So until we find artifacts, we can't say for sure, but we can use the geographic features such as uh, streams, uh, terraces, and other features to talk about dispersal routes and check particular areas for potential sites. But landscape archaeology uh, requires more and more uh, attributes to understand properly. Geological attributes, vegetation, elevation, drainage pattern, uh, archaeological patterning, so some places, the Shivalik sediments are horizontal, like this uh, location, for example. You see the different colored sediments. These are all belonging to uh, the Tatrat formation, going back to about 3 million, 4 million years old. And on these surfaces, we find artifacts on the bottom of the uh, slopes. Sometimes we find artifacts on top of the slopes. And various locations, we also find fossil bones. So in the past, the association of fossil bones and artifacts were misinterpreted to be contemporary. And they were thought to be representing evidence of Stone Age butchery. But then later on, uh, it was clear that there's something more uh, complex going on. Here we have tilted uh, Shivalik sediments, where more tectonics have taken place. And this tectonic process is still ongoing. Here, this is an example of how sites are forming, Stone Age sites. So uh, number one shows the landscape before human occupation, let's say uh, 4 million years ago during Tatra times. And then number two shows the site, same site during human occupation, let's say about 100,000 years ago. So you can see the Shivalik sediments have tilted and then the stone tools are being made in red color. And then after abandonment, Today, the site looks like this, totally disturbed. Artifacts are found at all elevations in all different contexts. So as you can see, it's a very challenging area to work in, uh, in terms of finding primary context sites, looking at spatial patterning, looking at land use patterns, looking at artifact densities, because as landscapes get disturbed over time, the artifacts are gonna get washed into different uh, areas. They're gonna get buried into younger contexts. So it's gonna change the nature of the original of the sites. Here's just a, 
uh, look at how artifacts are found in the field and what they look like before collection. Mostly uh, quartzite dominated. That was the main raw material in the Shoalix. And this is how artifacts are found in association with fossils. And by mapping and plotting uh, this material, we can find out that and confirm that the artifacts are younger and the fossils are older. Because the fossils are coming out of the Shoalix sediments, but the artifacts are coming from younger context and getting mixed up with the vertebrate fossils. But you have to be careful also because in some cases, it's also possible that they were contemporary in some locations. So each and every location of mixed fossils and artifacts uh, needs to be treated differently. So we have a very complicated uh, task uh, ahead of us. And what is interesting about Shoalix, if you see on the extreme right, the list of different animal species, all these lists show one thing, similar ecologies. So you have the list on the left from Damanisi, very famous uh, site with uh, human fossils and stone tools. Ubudea, again, same. Sangiran Formation in Southeast Asia. And the Pinjo Formation of the Shivalix. And what is interesting about this is that all of these animal uh, lists show a similar ecology. But what is different is the Shivalix list does not include homo uh, fossils. The other three sites have yielded homo fossils. So it shows that there's a potential of finding human fossils in the Shivalix because the ecology was similar to other sites in the old world. It was suitable for human occupation, for human habitation. The only problem is that uh, looking for this older evidence, if you want to look for one million year old artifacts, you need to look for one million year old sediments. The context has to be there. And those kind of contexts, older than one million, are very rare south of the Shivalix. In central India and peninsular India, we just have a few pockets of these uh, contexts. But Shivalix has a continuous sequence from 18 million to about half a million. So that's one of the best places to look for uh, older evidence, older than one million. So the question is whether there was older one in South Asia. Did the earliest dispersals from Africa pass through India with these technologies. The earliest technology that leaves Africa is called Oldowan. And the sites have been reported from Shivalik Hills in the north and Namada Valley in central India. I won't talk about the central Indian sites, but I'll talk about the uh, Shivalik sites. The Shivaliks of Pakistan and the Shivaliks of India have yielded very, very early uh, artifacts. And these sites actually have a problem. They have a problem because they're not either not excavated or they represent surface context, which is uh, dubious, or the artifacts are not enough, or uh, it's disturbed context, um, or uh, the, the site is maybe legitimate, but we don't have any. So it's not clear exactly whether these sites are legitimate or represent the earliest occupation. But if, from a broad perspective, the best studied evidence comes from Pakistan. The site of Rivat and the site of Pabi Hills, ranging from two to one. And these technologies resemble uh, the Damanisi evidence, the African evidence, the Chinese evidence. So it suggests that a Homo erectus reached here, or maybe another species, reached here very early. But again, we need to find something that can be excavated and dated properly. But all of these assemblages at the moment come from surface context or secondary context. Now the most recent discovery, a few years ago, they made near Chandigarh, an Indo-French team reported stone tools and uh, cut mark bones from the Shivalix, from the site of Masol. Now you can see on the top left, this picture is showing uh, cut marks on the bone. That suggests that the early hominins were using stone tools to cut meat from the bones and the stone tool made contact with the bone and left those marks. These kind of sites are found uh, frequently in Africa and China and Europe. 
but this is the first time somebody has reported it this old in uh, India. Now the problem is that we don't know if it's a primary context or a disturbed context. Plus, most of the evidence, including the cut marks, uh, cut mark bones, come from surface context. The artifacts, again, we don't know if they're contemporary or younger than the fossils. And cut marks can also be made by other processes, by trampling by large animals, by the teeth of predators, by grinding against stones through water transport. There are many, many processes where ancient bones can get uh, abraded or get these marks that look like cut marks. But then again, these could be cut marks, but again, can be short for short, or we can be shorter until we get them in excavated context with stone tools. But it is uh, exciting. It is possible that it is 2.6 million year old uh, presence of humans in the Shalix. There's potential. But more commonly, we find these kind of artifacts which are younger than the Shalix. Most occupation seems to take place at the end phase of the Shalix, when they were getting uplifted and after they were uplifted. Because that's when the raw material comes in from the Himalaya. These rocks that you see, the cobbles and pebbles, they come in large numbers. Uh, they're brought in by rivers, by slow processes, by tectonics. In large numbers, a huge amount of rocks over one million years are deposited on top of the Shoalik zone. So human occupation increases because of the availability of these rocks. The only problem is we don't know how old uh, these sites are. So these are typical Soinian artifacts. And if you look at it in a global perspective, what's happening at this time? Let's say uh, half a million years onwards, about 300,000 years onwards, when Homo sapien appears in Africa, uh, they start migrating to Europe, the Levant, China, possibly India. Then gradually they're interacting with uh, the Neanderthals, interacting with the Denisovans, various species. And if you look at the blue color on the map, that's actually the home range of the Neanderthals. And the purple area is where the Neanderthals and Homo sapiens mixed. So if you combine the blue and the purple, that's the entire home range of Neanderthals. And if you look at Teshek Tash in Central Asia, that's very close to the Himalaya. So it's possible that the Neanderthals came very close to the Himalaya. Now, last year, scientists reported this fossil of the Denisovans from the Tibetan Plateau over 3,000 meters in height, 130,000 years old. And earlier, this species was only known from Denisova Cave from a finger bone, but they finally found these jaw fragments in a cave in Tibet. And if you look at the elevation, 3,000 uh, 3, meters, and the proximity to the Himalaya, it also suggests that Denisovans may have occupied the Himalayan zone. We need to find more sites with uh, fossils and artifacts to confirm this. But this suggests that there's more potential in the Himalayan zone for prehistoric occupation than we thought earlier. And similar artifacts that resemble uh, Neanderthal toolkits have been found in Pakistan, in the Tar Desert, in the Sindh region. So these artifacts have been reported by uh, Italians and, and Pakistani colleagues. And they represent typical uh, Mousterian artifacts and Lavalwa technologies, which are associated with Neanderthals in Central Asia and Europe. So this could be the southeasternmost boundary of uh, Neanderthals uh, or similar uh, species making these technologies. In Nepal, we also have Middle Paleolithic. Seems to be older than 30,000. Again, found by Corvinus. So Nepal also needs more research. And the intermediate zone between Nepal and, and uh, Punjab has not been properly studied. So there's a lot of potential for finding new sites 
uh, that we don't know about, and also new technologies. So it's possible that multiple species were occupying these zones at different times. Then we have the site of uh, site 55 in Pakistan, dating to 45,000 years old. So as you see that we have possible older one assemblages, we have Acheulean assemblages, we have middle Paleolithic occupation, we have upper Paleolithic occupation across the Shivaliks and across the uh, middle zone of the Himalaya. This is the only well-dated site in the region, uh, in that Potwar uh, plateau. Now, just looking at rock art, because we have to look beyond stone tools. When we're looking at prehistory, we also have many other evidences, uh, not just fossils and stone tools. We also have rock art. So this distribution map of uh, plotted sites shows that the most of the rock art sites are in central India, eastern India, and south India. But if you look at the extreme top in the Himalayan zone, we have some sites uh, in the Himalayas as well. And these sites are dominated by the engravings or petroglyphs. These are, these are from Ludak. And they're found at many locations, very well known now. And the other evidence, which is rare actually, are paintings near Almora. The paintings are very rare in uh, Himalaya, but the bruisings and engravings are more common. But they're not found everywhere. So far, they're only in uh, the Ladakh area and pockets here and there. It's not a continuous occurrence uh, along the Himalaya or along the uh, mountain zone. I'm just going in chronological order. Uh, and getting to the Neolithic, uh, recently they reported 10,000 year old uh, King from Ladakh. And this was done by uh, ASI and Jammu University. So this shows uh, the earliest occupation of this region. There could be older evidences, but this is secure and dated. Older artifacts are there on the landscape, but they're not dated. They could be younger, they could be older, we don't know for sure. So the, the Neolithic evidence uh, is fairly early, uh, much earlier than we thought. But then what is also known as Kashmir Neolithic is a regional evidence. Kashmir Neolithic is distinct because it only occurs in the Kashmir Valley and surrounding landscapes. It's very distinct. It's only known from Burzohom and Gukral. Excavations took place very early, but several dozen sites are known uh, to occur all these places. And it's distinct for, uh, for yielding pit dwellings in the Karevas, bone tools, polished axes, animal bones, uh, hearts, post holes uh, showing structures, evidence of burials, dog domestication, uh, rock engravings, and multiple occupation levels. So why I'm highlighting this is because compared to the Ladakh evidence, this is much more well known and very rich. So it's possible that the Himalayan zone has a lengthy history of Neolithic occupation. And it was different everywhere. There were possibly different Neolithic cultures across time and space across the Himalaya. Some of them made uh, bruisings. Some of them maybe did not make bruisings. Uh, some of them uh, were focusing more on hunting, some more on domestication. The site, as it was excavated in the 1930s by Turner and Patterson, you can see the large trenches at the site, and also the large stone structures erected in later time periods. On the bottom left, you can see the men here. And today, the site looks like this. A very distinct and unique location. These are the pit dwellings, so the floor of the habitation structure was below the ground surface, about one meter below the ground surface. And then the rooftop was built. Human burials were also found there. These are all very well known, but only two have been excavated. So we need to excavate more sites. Dog burial.
and then rock bruisings, showing possibly a hunting scene. Again, these kinds of evidences are occurring in pockets. They're not widespread across the Himalaya. And then we have Neolithic-like elements found in various pockets, including India. And these show pitted stones, possibly used as anvils or hammer stones. We don't know the exact functions, but some of these assemblages are found with pottery. And the rounded rocks, uh, like these cobbles and pebbles, uh, these rounded uh, tools continue into uh, Harappan times. They're also found in Harappan sites in the region. So from Stone Age to Harappan times, the technology continues. So just to conclude and summarize what we know so far about uh, prehistory in the Himalaya and the Shivaliks, and also at the end, I'll just list out what we don't know and what we can do for future research directions. One thing is clear that prehistoric evidence actually belonging to all phases is present in the Himalaya in Shivaliks. So lower Paleolithic, uh, middle Paleolithic, upper Paleolithic, and very little uh, microlithic evidence is there. It's not abundant, but it is there. The Paleolithic evidence seems to be more common in the Shivalik zone because it's probably coming from the south coming from Northern India and Central India. So it's naturally going to be found more abundant in the Shivalik zone and not in the uh, deeper Himalaya. It's not clear if populations older than 10,000 occupied the high elevation zones. At the moment, we only have the Ladakh, Ladakhi evidence. But Paleolithic scatters and occurrences have been found uh, earlier from uh, Lidar Valley in Kashmir at 1,600 meters height, Nubra Valley, 3,000 meters height, and Spiti Valley, almost 4,000 meters height. But we don't know the ages of these uh, assemblages. They could be 50,000 years old. They could be uh, 200,000 years old. We don't know exactly. The technology seems to be mixed. Some places like Nubra Valley it might be Acheulean. In Nubra Valley, Spiti Valley, it might be Middle Paleolithic and Upper Paleolithic. It's not clear um, because these technologies can vary in age. The typology is not reliable always to give, a, to give an age bracket. And the historical sediments differ from the prehistoric patterns, mostly because of the need to accommodate villages and agricultural fields. So the historical sediments took place at different locations compared to the prehistoric ones. The prehistoric ones didn't need stable landscapes to, uh, for long-term habitation. They kept on foraging on the landscape. They were not settling in one place until maybe around the end of the Mesolithic. Now, just to conclude, uh, what we don't know, the big questions, and how uh, researchers can continue answering these questions and addressing the issues and filling the major gaps in our knowledge, one is, what is the age of the oldest human arrival in the region? Are there any legitimate old Oman sites? If there are, how old are they? Do they match the regional records from Africa, Europe, China? Were Neanderthals present in the Himalayan zones? And not just Neanderthals, but Denisovans as well. Maybe even other species that were endemic only to the subcontinent. How old are the different technologies? The Acheulean, the Soinian, the Mousterian reported from Pakistan. And when do Homo sapiens first occupy the Himalayan zone? Is it only during the uh, Neolithic or is it before that? And were the Himalaya always a barrier or were certain passes crossed uh, in certain seasons? At the moment, it's, it's always been viewed as a barrier, but it's not impossible that uh, populations were moving back and forth from the Tibetan plateau and to the Shivaliks. Maybe uh, 50,000 years onwards, maybe certain passes were available uh, and accessible for migrations and dispersals. 
Did the Shivalik zone facilitate dispersals from west to east? This is a very important point. We don't know if populations continued eastwards out of India or they stopped at certain locations. They stopped in central Himalaya, for example, or they ended up in northeast India. They did not continue eastwards. Uh, we don't know whether India was used as a corridor for dispersals from west to east and uh, east to west. We know that populations come into India from Southeast Asia very late, but why don't they come in earlier or why don't they leave much earlier from west to east? We don't know these things. There's no major sites reported. The technologies are missing in Northeast India, diagnostic technologies. So there's no clear knowledge of connections between India and Southeast Asia and East Asia. And finally, where can we find primary contact sites for excavations. Uh, as you saw in the photograph, the Shivalik landscape is very disturbed, but it's still possible to find uh, primary contact sites. It's a matter of using specific uh, attributes and specific knowledge to look for uh, less disturbed sites and excavate them and get some dates to make uh, a better understanding of the relationships of uh, between populations in the Shivalik zone and peninsular India and also, of course, between the Himalayan zone and other parts of Asia. And that's uh, the end of my talk. I would just like to thank uh, all these institutions uh, and uh, governments and people uh, for their help along the way and for special permissions, for financial assistance, for discussions, uh, for suggestions. And if you have any questions that you think of later, uh, you can contact me at the email address given below. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pat, for that wonderful lecture. Of course, you uh, now have us all uh, glued in more uh, to what's happening in the Himalayas and prehistory. Because so many of us, you know, it's a, such a technical side of uh, archaeology that a lot of people kind of shy away from it. And with your lecture, you've made it so simple in understanding it uh, of such a repository of research. So we thank you for that. And... Um, uh, I have a question and in the meantime, uh, those of you who have questions, please raise your hands and I'll take it in the order they come in. And my first uh, question is about, you know, the recent discovery in Ethiopia uh, at, in Afar, where uh, the cranium was found in relation to the uh, Acheulean and the Olduvan tools. And that kind of takes away uh, uh, putting one species with one tool kind of a thing, right? Uh, and you did tell us that uh, crania haven't really been found except the one uh, that was initially found. So do you see that with more research and more funding, if such a scenario would uh, uh, emerge, what, are you, what is your opinion about it? You know, like every time, you know, a new discovery is made, it just changes everything about what we know. And we have to like get new editions of the book. And I feel that it's really uh, happening at a faster uh, pace in prehistory than in any other field. So if you could shed light on that. Yes, I do certainly think there is potential uh, because research that has not been done that much. Uh, we, if, even if you get funding, the only problem is the challenge, the logistical challenge of finding the right sites, the finding the right context, getting into the interior zones to look for sites, uh, finding the right dispersal routes, for example. So we can use modern technologies today available uh, and new dating techniques as well. Uh, to survey for sites. But I think that, um, I think we should not view the Himalayan zone or even the Indian zone as a homogenous unit. I think we should expect diversity in archeological evidence along the Himalaya as well. From uh, the Western Himalaya, Central Himalaya and the Eastern zone, we should expect different signatures and different histories and possibly different species uh, occupying these zones at different times. But there's a lot of potential. There's a lot of potential. So. We need to expand on that for sure, especially in the Western Himalayas as well. Now that we work there, we really need to explore and uh, with you, of course. That's the main entry point for population coming in. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so we have three hands that are raised. And before I take Amal, Amal, you'll be the, uh, the first one to ask your question. I'm also launching a poll 
so I've never done the poll on this thing. So if it kind of distorts things, uh, my apologies. So the poll is on lecture time that suits better, 8 p.m. IST or 7 p.m. IST. So if you could all participate in that. And uh, Amal, over to you with your question. Yes, uh, thank you for your lecture, Pop. It was a very good session. And uh, I was wondering whether uh, you meant you in, the, you in your presentations and slides, it was shown in the figures that the, uh, I mean, the dispersion process began from Africa. Right. 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 So, oh, what, what, what was the basis on that was? You know, uh, how, how, what, how do you justify that their propagation started from Africa? Um, at the moment, we're going by available evidence. So wherever we have the oldest sites, we count that as a source region. Wherever we have the youngest, oh, okay. we count that as the direction of dispersal. Yeah. So what was, what was bugging me was that we have so many ancient texts like Mahabharata and Ramayana, for example, and it shows that the Aryan culture actually, and the Aryan culture was propagating from Russia, right? And in the text, they say that um, the bad, so would you, would you like, would you suggest or would you refer this kind of text for this? Um, the, top, the evidence I was talking about actually, it predates the Aryan uh, culture. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So for younger periods, let's say if we're talking about uh, protohistoric onwards, protohistoric and historical periods, texts to find uh, ancient places, to find uh, cer certain geographic hints, for example, to locate sites. But when I'm looking at Stone Age evidence, that's okay. when the uh, uh, evidence will not be uh, useful for me. Oh. That will be disconnected so, in time. So, yes. So this you are saying, right? Hello? Yeah. Hello? Yes, uh, so, uh, uh, so you, you, you found evidences from the Stone Age period, but uh, have you found anything related to this Aryan period? No. I mean, I was just curious enough. No. <laughs> okay. No, 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 no. I don't work on that time period. Yeah, so Amal, uh, the Aryan period is much later. This is prehistory, uh, much earlier, much earlier. Okay. So uh, we'll take the next question. Tanya, over to you. Tanya, oh, very sure, happy sure. to very happy to see you. Uh, Tanya was our student, Parth and I. So um, yeah, over Hi. to Tanya. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Uh, nice hearing you talk again. Uh, yeah, um, I was a little curious about when you were talking about the Shivalik region and how um, you know the you about how the three steps you showed and how the, you're not sure if the primary you what you are finding is in its primary context. So you only spoke about finding stone tools and how there's a potential or a possibility of finding uh, fossils over there. I was wondering if you found any other kind of evidence to suggest that besides the stone tools, you know, like botanical remains or anything like that. No, normally uh, we will look for botanical remains after finding the stone tools. Okay. Those will be the first hint. Hmm. Uh, and of course, animal fossils. So these two things are the primary evidences we look for. Uh, some human activity or some kind of uh, uh, landscape or ecological city. And then let's say that we find a primary site, uh, then we excavate it. Then we would collect the sediments from the excavations and process for the plant evidence. All right, okay. Reconstruct the past habitat. Got it, okay, thanks. Thank you. Over to uh, Aniket, Dr. Aniket Alam. You can take on the mic now. Yeah, hi. Just call me Aniket. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, thank you, okay. Park. Uh, I'm also going to call you just Park. It's, I think, uh, much easier than this sure. honorific. It was excellent. I've uh, always been sort of reading up about these things, but never, you know, uh, I'm not an archaeologist and somehow as a historian, especially a modernist, it's always a bit of a 
um uh you know there's a there's a mental block i think we guys have about uh, accessing uh, prehistory but this was really really interesting and i would like to get back in touch with you on other things but here i just wanted something if you could uh, take a few minutes to say something about the nubra valley and the spiti valley that you mentioned and what exactly are the hypotheses that archaeologists are working on and what exactly is uh, i mean why spiti valley why not other places in the satoj valley for example or maybe in the bias valley and um, is it uh, coming from tibet or is it going up from the shivaliks and, and what exactly is the hypothesis there um the first thing that i would say is that i uh, see the this work that i mentioned in uh, uh, nubra valley and spiti valley is being done by other people by my colleagues uh, and my juniors. So I'm not familiar with it firsthand. Well, I can only tell you what I know about it. Now, the thing is that uh, I can tell you from an archeologist's perspective, uh, why we're finding evidence there and not other places. Uh, one main reason is because we haven't looked everywhere properly. Uh, we haven't done any research in the right places. To, we, there, there could be sites everywhere, actually. Uh, once uh, Homo sapiens becomes mobile, with these middle paleolithic uh, technologies, they become widespread. They disperse very quickly and easily. So these assemblages we find in Nubra Valley and Spiti Valley could actually be everywhere. But the another other factor for absence of assemblages could be uh, the lack of suitable raw material. If you don't have good rocks, then maybe those areas are avoided by the human populations. So maybe these valleys that we have found sites they have good uh, suitable rocks for making stone tools. And also uh, access for archeologists. Easy access to these locations maybe has yielded more sites. Maybe if you look into interior zones uh, where there are no roads, for example, isolated valleys, maybe those places also preserve uh, assemblages, similar assemblages. So it's a matter of actually looking systematically and more uh, intensively. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we have uh, uh, Vijay Lakshmi Ji. Your uh, you can take on the mic now. And yeah. those of you who haven't voted, please vote. We just have twenty-five out of thirty-one votes. Really make, need to make a decision, or I'll follow the middle path. Okay. So please do that. Is that a threat? <laughs> Request. <laughs> Doctor Pat, I'm just a curious person. Yeah. was a very devoted member of this group. Uh, you just showed one example of rock art. Uh, in uh -huh. this area, did you not find any more? And if not, what is the reason? Is there a relationship between use of, um, you know, use of tools and rock art or the lack of rock? I know this is a very basic question, but I'm just curious, as I said. Right. See, if you look at it from a all India perspective, you notice on the map that the rock art is in specific locations. So yes. absent in Maharashtra, for example, uh, because there's no suitable rock surface to make the paintings. Uh, the Deccan uh, basalt is there, the, all these uh, uh, Western Ghats, for example, but the rock is not suitable for making paintings. So the same manner in the Himalaya, maybe the rock was not suitable everywhere, for making uh, paintings. And we also have to look at it geologically. Uh, geologically, let's say that uh, they could have been everywhere. But if these paintings are constantly exposed to natural elements, then they will not get preserved. So it's a matter of looking at the right places uh, and looking for uh, well-preserved paintings compared to ones that have been uh, destroyed through uh, natural processes. So there are probably more paintings than we uh, no, now, but maybe not as abundant as Central India and South India. That was my question because I know that there is quite a lot in Bimbetka and places like that. Yes, people haven't yeah. surveyed it. We need to survey it. Okay, all right. And I was very interested in the fact that we had hippopotami. Hippopot I didn't know that. Yes. So it just yes. shows you what kind of an ignoramus I am. I <laughs> of my ignorance. But thank you, that was wonderful. 
So, Pat, I have a question. Uh, when we talk about like Paleolithic, of course, that's and uh, uh, we are on the quest of the Paleolithic uh, and, and trying to understand and discern things. But also when it comes to the Neolithic, uh, we, we know about Burza home in Kashmir. But uh, do you think that even, in, I, I don't know whether research has been done in the Western Himalayas, especially in the Kulu Valley and Spiti, whether we have Neolithic, potential Neolithic sites, because I feel that especially, um, I really feel there could be potential there, right? Yes, yes. In fact, we have better chance of finding uh, Neolithic sites than older sites. Yeah. And I feel those are, so, there's so many menhirs that I've come across that have not been documented. We, 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 we know of it together, especially yes, yes. in the region we are, and a lot of rock shelters, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So uh, maybe we should uh, uh, have some kind of an expedition where, you know, uh, non-academics and academics are really wanting to explore. We should do that uh, once this corona thing dies out and explore and uh, right. document these places. Especially uh, when we're talking earlier about uh, looking at the roots that the uh, shepherds are taking. Exactly. These roots are used for thousands of years. Yeah. There might be archaeological signatures along those routes that people have not checked yet. So there is potential. Yeah. And I know that uh, one of our students, Ubed, uh, is working with the Bakravals, following them. And there are many yes. others as well. So it would be very interesting to take uh, on the... And even talk to Dr. Kaushal about things that she has seen while working with the Gaddis. And, uh, you know, talk to them because memory is so important. This memory of... Uh, things of their uh, ancestors it may be like divorced by time like a very a significant portion of time but uh, at least those uh, trails you know they would have markers which in the memory of right. these people would still be alive so, right yeah okay uh, any I more questions some questions in the, in the chat box i think oh they are uh, i think so okay so those who have given questions in the chat box it would be wonderful if you could raise your hands because it's really difficult to scroll up and find those. Please, would you do that for us, please? Uh, I know I'm getting a lot of uh, this thing about not having a third option for my poll because I didn't want to give a third option. So, uh, yes, can, can uh, should I just call out the names? Yeah. Okay, just a second. It's very difficult for me to scroll up for some reason. Mm -hmm. Bath, would you mind doing that? Wait, wait, I can, I, I've got the handle on it now. Okay. Um, okay, so Anubhav has a question. He uh -huh. asks, uh, no, she, Anubhav is a student, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Paleolithic sites in the Indian Shivaliks are all in surface context. Despite excavations in Guler, Dehra, Gopipur, and Toka, even Masol. Nothing in situ or stratified has been discovered. What could be the probable reason for this? Erosion in the Shivaliks? That's the, that's the main reason. Erosion is one, but also a uh, lack of systematic surveys, I would say. Mm -hmm. People have done so far is uh, when they started finding sites after Deter and Patterson in the 1930s, mm -hmm. people started focusing for five decades on similar contexts like terraces. Mm -hmm. So terraces, you're just going to find surface sites. People have never looked at uh, older sediments, the older Shivalik sediments, for stratified sites. Mm -hmm. So nobody uh, strategically and look, targeting specific locations for primary context sites. Mm -hmm. The things sure are stratified out there, whether they're primary or secondary, but people have not looked in that manner. Mm -hmm. Most have been surveyed randomly. So that's the problem. That's the problem. And, and even in uh, south of Shivalik, in west of India, everywhere, most sites are going to be uh, surface sites in general, but stratified sites only if you dig a surface site. You need a rich surface site to dig and uh, extract more uh, buried artifacts. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember when I was in school, I used to, because my mother is from the Shivalik area, from Sirmore, and there is a, a, an archaeological site there, Saketi. Saketi. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, fossil site. Fossil, fossil site. site. And, uh, yeah. Also. Yeah. So, could you shed a little light on that as well about people who are, you know, not in academia who really want to know about this more? They can visit that site and um, 
if you could just tell. So, the, the name you mentioned, Saketi, it's uh, actually a fossil park. And the whole area is known for uh, yielding many animal fossils for many decades. So the, the GSI, the Geological Survey of India, they made it into a fossil park. So they have established a small museum. And if anybody's passing by, uh, it's actually in Kalaam. So Kalaam is the turn off for Nahan and uh, Chandigarh. So that area has this uh, museum and it's worth visiting. And uh, I think uh, BC Verma of GSI has done most of the work there and recovered many animal fossils and also stone tools. Although he misinterpreted them to be contemporary and representing butchery, but he, dis he has discovered a lot of uh, sites over there and it's a very interesting area. And some of the photographs I showed of uplifted layers and uplifted landscapes is actually from that area. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, I was so uh, enthusiastic and I went into that fossil park. Uh, that was my first tryst with, uh, you know, uh, uh, the prehistoric period. So it's very when important. Did you go? Huh? When did you go? When was uh, that? 1993. Uh, okay, because now they have made a new museum. They made a new museum. It's a new one. Yeah. Same location. It's much better. Yeah. I, I thought of myself as an archaeologist back then when I was in school. So I was just busy. I was like, I'm going to do make a discovery. And it's so important for those of you who really want to be a part of all of this. Just go and, you know, discoveries can be made by anyone. You know, even people who thought that they were discovering, uh, 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 you know, uh, things that they really believed in, like Columbus was wrong. So it's, it's never right or wrong. It's about your enthusiasm. So go for it, right? And join us in this effort. So um, Manan has, uh, uh, he stated that petroglyphs have been reported in the Western region as well in the Ratnagiri caves. Okay. So, and uh, Suramya, uh, no, Suramya doesn't have a question. Uh, Red, Red Me. Red Me is a phone company, right? So I do not know the name of this person, but I know that he or she uses Red Me. Uh, is there a possibility of finding sites in inner regions like Chamba in Himachi Pradesh? That's the question. It depends. It depends on several factors. Number one, what is the landscape over there? Is it flat? Is it steep? Uh, is it does it have drainage, for example? The other issue is for number one, what number one criteria for locating stone age sites is actually good stone. If there was no good stone over there, then maybe uh, humans did not settle over there, or uh, they made artifacts on poor quality stone. But those artifacts did not uh, uh, survive properly. They don't get preserved properly. So it, there's a lot of factors that affect how we look for sites and where we would find sites. But yes, every location is worth looking once. At least. Uh, you never know. Sometimes you might, might find something unexpected, something new. So uh, every region, wherever it's uh, flat enough to settle, it has water resources, it has rock resources, could have potential for finding sites. Maybe not pure paleolithic sites, but definitely uh, Neolithic sites. Okay, so we don't have any questions, so I'm just going to leave it open. So those of you who really have something to ask, please do that at this point in time. We also have the results of our poll. 7 p.m. is better than 8 p.m. 58% uh, voted for 7 p.m. and 42% for 8 p.m. Not too much of a difference. So should we just follow the middle path and take 7.30 instead? What do you say, Par? Uh, I'm fine with anything. My schedule is flexible. Okay. Uh, any of you would 7.30 be better? So that we are good with both sides and we do not incur the wrath of people. So we'll go for 7.30 every Sunday. Okay, so I'm getting a thumbs up and yeses, yeah. And of course, uh, in the past uh, week, we discussed that a lot of you gave suggestions of uh, probable topics that you would want. So I'm taking, uh, I and Parth uh, both together are taking those things into consideration. And uh, we uh, will be curating that list and sharing, sharing it with you shortly. Uh, so if you have any more questions, please, uh, you can take on the floor. Um, Oh, Vibhaji just said not too much of a difference between the percentile. By 2%, we've had to do Brexit. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, uh, Vibhaji has a question. Yes, please uh, take on the mic. 
You know, as a very young student, I read out a paper by Dr. Sonakia when he had just discovered that Homo erectus, uh, you know, portion from the skull. And he didn't want to read out the paper. And I was an MSc student in Delhi, and my teacher, who was teaching us prehistory in anthropology, he said, Vibha, will you please read out this paper? Dr. Sunakya does not want to read it out. So it was an international archaeological conference. <laughs> and, and I'm reading out this paper and thinking to myself, my goodness, this is amazing. I think he does not want to read it out, but he was ready for questions. He was readying himself for questions because it was amazing. He was the envy of all the prehistorians in India at that time because even my department used to take so many field trips of students to the same place in Narbada to collect all these hand axes and cleavers and scrapers and everything. And they never came across that, that part of Homo erectus uh, skull. And it yeah. was just, it's, it's like erosion that, you know, he was taking a walk and he saw something and he got it out and it turned out. But what I wanted to ask you was what happened after that? Because I know that there were, the French um, were interested in dating it and this and that. But after that, I have not heard much about it. It's almost like because no other Homo erectus remains were found. So, I mean, or maybe because I have not kept up, kept up. To, um, kept up with it. Uh, but I was just kind of curious that, you know, uh, what was the implication of that discovery on this kind of prehistory, the study of prehistory, and whether there were any other efforts made to find out whether there were any other uh, remains of Homo erectus to be found, or, or how it Im impacted the study as such? Um, actually, since 1980s, ever since it was found, uh, multiple teams have been going out there and looking for fossils. Uh, because that kind of uh, led to more research uh, and more surveys. So some fossils have been found uh, by uh, Dr. Sankhyan. Uh, mm -hmm. He has found a, a collarbone, uh, the clavicle. He has found uh, some rib fragments, maybe uh, some leg, fra leg bone fragments. Okay. But it's not clear uh, the age of these uh, specimens, the taxonomic affinities. These things are not clear. Uh, they have been found from different locations around Hakora. But uh, our project also, we initiated this project in uh, uh, 2005, specifically for finding more uh, human fossils. So now what we're doing is we're using uh, remote sensing and uh, GIS to kind of predict locations of fossils and kind of narrow down the search and spend less uh, effort and less time. Uh, but one thing is that the first work we did uh, in that area, we tried to date the site where they found the, where Sonakia found the uh, cranium. So we collected animal teeth from the site, and then we used uh, ESR dating and uranium CD dating, and we found out that the context where it's found is actually as young as uh, 50,000 years old. So everything in that deposit, it's, it's mixed. It's young artifacts and old artifacts, young fossils and old fossils. Everything is mixed because of the Narmada River. So the, art, the actual fossil came from a different location. Uh, and now we're trying to find similar fossils in more, uh, in less disturbed context, less dis disturbed sites. Parth, I have a question with the Narmada, yeah. uh, with the Narmada uh, uh, um, Sadar Sarova Dam. Uh, do you think uh, we lost a lot of uh, that information? Like, um, uh, do you think uh, that, yeah. Some places, yes, but uh, the ASI actually did surveys out there. They did salvage archaeology and they published this information also. So I think they did make collections uh, and uh, a lot of extensive surveys and they did documentation. But of course, eventually you can't collect everything and you can't excavate everything. So a lot of it was lost. And this is happening every year, in fact, because of the uh, floods, for example, the high water levels. A lot of sites get submerged, uh, get destroyed uh, along the main river. And That's very really sad, yeah. Okay. Um, so we don't have any questions anymore. So I'll make a few announcements. So uh, we have decided on uh, doing Sunday, 7.30 p.m. following the middle path. Uh, two, I uh, wanted to make an announcement for those of you who have not been following uh, Facebook, though I 
really make you all follow it by posting, um, sharing posts right from there. So pardon me if you do not like Facebook, but it's a good networking kind of thing and posting things so that we are all connected. Uh, but yes, uh, we have joined uh, with an NGO, Sanskriti. Uh, uh, we've um, got our first phase of books, about 120 books for kids. Uh, we'll be opening uh, the library once the corona situation uh, stabilizes for uh, kids of uh, the villages uh, that surround the institute. Uh, they can come and they can read and we will do, we'll be doing storytelling sessions and, uh, uh, and you know, kind of uh, taking and making them addicts into culture and heritage. You know, it's, they have to start young and I feel that's a very promising age for uh, children to get uh, sensitized to culture and heritage. So this is our endeavor of uh, uh, the social side of it. We really want uh, uh, kids at, the, at that level to come in. And uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Mahima Mehra because she kind of uh, uh, attached me to Jogendra Rohila who is from Sanskriti. And I'm so, so happy uh, that um, that consignment is with us and we'll be sharing that with uh, the kids and opening up this world for them. So that's really, uh, uh, really, I feel very happy about it. And uh, yeah, and those of you who want to share kids books, please do that. We have about 120, but of course, sky is the limit. Uh, you know, Parth and I envisage a library, which, which goes from uh, the base to the ceiling with books and books and books, right? So if you want to share your books that are old or new, uh, it doesn't matter as long as they are filled with knowledge of the Himalayas please share it and uh, you can send it to us, uh, the address, so you can ask us. So please do that. And um, uh, I want to thank Parth for this uh, wonderful lecture on prehistory. And I would really ask you to uh, tell us more about, uh, you know, topics like rock art, uh, at the petroglyphs, uh, you know, you or your students, we would love to uh, share that with on our forum, which is your forum, you know. So... Uh, Thank you so much, Parth. And um, uh, please let us know if you have questions. You can write to Parth, you can write to me, and you can write to all other admins uh, who are uh, uh, on the forum. And please uh, share uh, views uh, on our interaction page on Facebook. That's the place for interacting. I also want to thank Vibhaji. She, whenever she, she sees a post which is not relevant, if it's totally political on, the, uh, on our uh, institute page, she just, you know, uh, uh, tags it. So uh, thank, thank you for keeping a watch on that. And uh, thank you all for being here today. And uh, next Sunday, we'll meet at 7.30 and I'll make an announcement uh, of, uh, of the speaker. It could be me, it could be anyone. So that's a mystery. So thank you so much and have a wonderful evening. Thank you for giving me this opportunity and thank you everyone for listening. Bye. Bye. Good night. Good morning. <laughs> good night. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Bye.